welcome to the Entrepreneur and You and Territory and Petron series on entrepreneurship. I'm your host, Mike Kaysen. Today we're here with Ryan Buckley, who is an author and a serial entrepreneur. We're very excited to have him. Hi, Ryan. How are you today? Hey, good to meet you, Mike. Let's start with a little background information. Where are you from? I'm actually from the Bay Area. I was born and raised in Mountain View down the peninsula and went to Los Altos High School. Nice. I'm a Monta Vista guy myself. So did you always know that you wanted to be an entrepreneur? No, I, I didn't. I always did like creating stuff. I enjoyed music and writing music and did a fair bit of that. I went to UC Berkeley, stayed in the Bay Area, and I loved it there. I graduated in 2000, took a couple years off and decided I really wanted to get back into environmental policy and went to the Harvard Kennedy School. And while I was there, I got into entrepreneurship. A friend that I'd met in Los Angeles had an idea to create a company. So he and I started Script, and this was an online screenwriting software product. Script.com, right? That was. Yeah, Script spelled like Ripped, S C R I P P E D. So can you tell me a little bit about Script.com and, and how it came to fruition? Yeah. So this was. 2005, 2006, and the idea of being able to write a document online was, was pretty new, synchronizing all the time and that you can collaborate in real time with someone else. Brand new concept. High-speed internet now is ubiquitous. Everybody's looking to the internet, to the cloud to do pretty much everything. And we thought, let's be the online screenwriting software product. But we ran into a few problems. Every business plan competition that we submitted to wouldn't even let us pass the first round because we couldn't answer the basic question of who are your customers and how are you going to make money? We answered that in two different ways. We said, well, studios will buy from us. We have this community of screenwriters and a ton of scripts, and these are going to be searchable and make it a lot easier for studio executives to identify top talent and read screenplays. Problem with that was if you asked any studio executive, what problem do you have? What's your biggest pain point? Not a single one of them would say, I don't see enough screenplays. If anything, <laughs> their desks were piled. So we thought, okay, can we monetize our writers somehow? Can we get them to pay for this product? And your typical screenwriter who is not able to afford the most well-known box product, they're not going to be able to afford to pay for us either. You're kind of squeezing water out of rocks if you're going after the starving artist screenwriter and expecting to build a business out of that. So Script, unfortunately, tapped out at about $15,000 of revenue per month. And we'd raised a few hundred thousand, but we were not going to be able to raise any more. How did you get to the point where it's like, you know what, there's no more that I can get from this business? Because 15000 a month actually sounds like a lot to most people. Yeah, 15000 a month was not bad from a lifestyle business standpoint. There were two of us still on board at this point, my co-founder and I, and we were both now in our mid twenties living in the Bay area, which even in 2010 was not a cheap place to live. So it was very hard to raise money and any money that was going out was really only going to be allocated to surefire bets. So what we decided to do was I went off and I went to another startup. I learned some incredibly valuable lessons. And the CEO of that company was a pretty well-known serial entrepreneur and angel investor. And I met some great engineers and got exposure to some new technologies. We kind of stumbled into an opportunity to take our best screenwriters, to start farming them out to our business friends who needed content marketing done. This would be blog posts, tweets, press releases, white papers. We knew that screenwriters had a very special kind of skill that would make them really good at this growing field called content marketing. But all of a sudden, Google was getting a lot smarter and companies were struggling to keep up. So they needed some really high quality content. And for that, they needed really good writers. Along the way, I had acquired scripted.com. We tested it with my friends from business school. We were able to get customers right away and we had the supply side already. So the business 
pieces were there. We just put them together and we were able to generate 50,000 in marketplace revenue that first year. And we were able to raise $1 million of venture capital the next year. Wow. And from that, we were able to build a team and we got a big office and we grew the team out to 35 people. And we kind of rode this out for seven years. And we finally exited that business in 2017. It sounds like the success of the business came from the ability to pivot. Yeah, we went from really wanting to build a product to having an idea for a real business. And those are two different ways to start a company. One of them has a much greater likelihood for success. It was just one of those unfortunate Silicon Valley stories of a business that raised a ton of money and was not able to see that valuation on the other side. But we did get a relationship with a private equity firm that still owns Scripted. Script, we had actually sold essentially for pennies. So we found a good home for it. But in the meantime, I wrote a book called The Parallel Entrepreneur. So we have that book here. So this is The Parallel Entrepreneur, Ryan's book. It's a great read. Highly recommend it. I think it's a very easy read. It gives actionable things that you can do as an entrepreneur. It's launched you into a kind of a speaking role here at Diablo Valley College and then also across the country, right? Yeah, it's it's been really fun seeing the reach that it got. It was just something that I wanted to do for myself and for friends of mine who kept asking me, how do I start my own business? So a little bit of context. During the latter stages of script and scripted, I started to learn how to program. And then when I was at that sales job between script and scripted, I became friends with one of the engineers there who was willing to help me use Python to improve my sales output. I'd uh, you know, be Googling for prospects. Like I wanted lists of people to reach out to and I'd come across maybe a directory on a web page. And I was asking him, isn't there a programmatic way to go page by page by page on this directory and pull it all into a CSV file? So he showed me how to do that in Python. That was like what sort of blew my mind. I was like, okay, now I kind of get it. From there, I wanted to learn how to actually build a web-based app. And one of the products that I just wanted to build was a way to figure out people's business email addresses. And started out just kind of like, okay, I'm going to learn how to do this. I'm gonna tell my friends about it. I'm gonna see what they're willing to pay. I wanna make this accessible to more people. I'm going to figure out how to host this script online so that anyone can sign up for it. And I did that and pretty soon I was making more money on that side business than I was from my paycheck at Scripted. So I started building out other web apps because I just really enjoyed doing it and I was getting better at it, I was getting faster at it. That's really what spawned this idea of parallel entrepreneurship. You don't move your money serially when you're invested in your Fidelity or your E-Trade account. And like, no, you spread it across well, I've heard the expression, you back the jockey, not the horse, right? So I think that that's a lot of the VC yeah. mentality is they want somebody who has skin in the game. And that's what you hear, right? So, you know, I work with a lot of clients looking for capital. And one of the big problems is, you know, uh, they have to have a day job and yeah. they can't devote 100% of their time to their startup. So yeah. what would you recommend? How, what advice would you give to those people who are like, listen, if I don't have a day job, I'm not going to be able to support my hobby, which is my business. <laughs> no, exactly. I just stand by the idea that it is perfectly ethical and fair to use your day job to finance your side hustle. So long as you're not in conflict with your employment agreement. I go through some examples in the parallel entrepreneur where there's a clear violation of that. You can't take your employer's IP and go start your own business with it or take it to someone else's business. Your nighttime hours are your hours to do whatever you want. You can watch Game of Thrones, you can watch Warriors, or you can start businesses. Let's switch gears a little bit and talk about idea generation because I know that's kind of your specialty. You have given several talks about idea generation. What does that mean? How do you come up with the ideas for your businesses? Give me a rundown. 
yeah, you want to do a scripted process and not a script process. You want to have customers already in mind, already validated before you go and build the product. And that was the problem with script. We had no idea how we were going to monetize it and we never tested that. Fast forward four years later, we had my business school colleagues asking me if they could get in touch with one of our writers to write blog posts for them. We had customers and we had the components of a product, but there was no product there. So you want to kind of replicate and sort of manufacture that latter example. And the question is, how do you do that? What you do is you test it with a landing page. You're really pretending that your product already exists and you're making them sign up to something that is actually just a dummy sign up page where they're going to be redirected and say, oh, thank you for your interest. We're not quite ready yet. We're going to launch this thing next month. Even though there's literally nothing there, you're actually pretending like it's a real product. The other one is to just run advertisements, throw them to a landing page. You're essentially creating a page that's clearly an advertisement and you're saying, click here for more information. Give me your email address for more information. Or if you really wanted to get aggressive, you could say prepay for this product now and receive a big discount later. And then you can actually test willingness to pay. But initially what you're doing is you're testing the advertising market, seeing how many clicks you can generate and what that's going to cost on a per click basis. Now you have traffic on your landing page and you're looking at your conversion rate. Start to understand the mechanics of your market a little bit. It's not perfect. Nothing is going to be a complete comprehensive substitute for having an actual product that you can demo and kind of go through that cycle with. But you get some directional information that can really help you make a better decision about whether to move forward with a product or not. When you have a list of email addresses and you're able to actually have a couple of conversations with real people who you've never met before about this product, when they actually seem excited about something, that's a really good sign and you should probably start thinking about, okay, what's the minimum viable solution here? What's the least amount of effort I need to put in to give this customer something that they will pay for. It sounds like your overall philosophy is find the buyer first. That, yeah, it's how do you manufacture that? You get an idea, it seems interesting to you, but can you find buyers for that idea and put yourself through the pain of finding those first buyers before you actually build your product? Ryan, what's the best career advice you have ever received? Focus on family and friends. Of course your career is important. Like everybody needs to have an income. I've been an East Bay Times subscriber now for a while. I, I'll, I'll explain why this is, but I, I have been drawn to the obituaries. None of those obits have said anything about John was this amazing person, but regretted not making more money. Every single one is like, enjoyed spending time with their family, had cooking clubs, had poker clubs, had a group of guys that they would go fishing with for 50 years. Like those are the things that get mentioned in these obituaries. I kind of use this as a reminder, what am I really going to think about when it's, when it's my turn to go? It's probably not going to be like, I wish I started one more business. No, it's, it's really all about lifestyle. All right, Ryan, it's been a real pleasure talking to you. I could sitting here all day. You're a wealth of knowledge and I really appreciate your book and everything that you're doing. So it's been lovely. Hopefully we can do this again sometime. It's been a pleasure being affiliated with DVC. I, I love what Diablo Valley College is doing and happy to help. Thank you very much. All right, guys, this has been Entrepreneur and You. We'll see you next time.